We are good to go. Awesome. Thanks you. Thank you so much, Audra. Um, and welcome, everyone. Um, you know, I know everyone is caring so much right now. And I, if, if uh, Nevada is the same, Nevada is the same as uh, Washington, colds and flus are flying around in addition to uh, COVID. So I hope you're hanging in there and staying healthy. I have a uh, a 40 minute overview of a resource collection to put on the table and we'll do a little bit of uh, dipping into the collection to kind of learn about the pieces that are there. I was just telling Audra, I was in pretty slow connection at the moment. Um, and so like I was trying to like push some uh, files up to broadly share and I didn't quite get it done because like it's going to long. So I do have things that I'll put up into a folder and I'll, I'll let me get started and then I'll talk about it as we kind of find our way in. Um, all right. And our friends are joining us. Excellent. All right. So hopefully that looks OK. I see some nodding. OK. Uh, so, uh, for the past eight years, our research team here at the University of Washington, <laughs> working with uh, Andre DeLone, De Leon uh, there in uh, Nevada and uh, all of the counterparts of state science supervisors across the country and other networks implementing next generation science standards, um, have been trying to build sources together um, to try to help each other find our way through implementing the vision that's in the NRC framework. Um, in the, um, let's see, I need to get to one more tab here. I, hold on. Oh, here we go. Okay. So um, the file, I wasn't a, so I, you know, part of our tradition is to share everything everywhere. Um, so the slide deck will be posted in the link that's shown on the slide that I just dropped in chat. It's not there yet because that was the glitch I hit right before I was joining. So it'll be there this afternoon um, once I figure out what's going on. And you, so you don't have to take notes or anything. You can just release it back and uh, kind of sink into what I'm going to share today. So um, we are... Oh, over a decade in on implementing the NRC framework for K-12 science education, the strongest consensus image of what K-12 science ed might and should look like uh, that we've ever had, actually, as a field, in, in my view, has led to 44 states adopting some version of the framework vision shown on the left. About half of them have formally adopted a version of next generation science standards specifically. So we have a lot of good shared work um, to be engaging in. And part of our goal is like, how do you infrastructure learning and implementation? How do you build the resources and capacities to kind of enact those visions across um, spaces of science ed? And so that's where we're headed in the next uh, chunk of time here. We know from the framework vision, building on decades of research and teaching uh, in, of science, that students learn science best by engaging in science and engineering practices as part of sustained investigations and throughout those endeavors of display core ideas of science and cross-cutting concepts that span science. And so a lot of the resources turn around how to be, um, take that three-dimensional view of learning and build capacity um, to do equitable versions of it across all the spaces where um, that happens and could happen. So we, eight years ago, came up with a strategy. Um, basically, in the world, there were research briefs and there were policy briefs, but we realized that there weren't really practice briefs. So how do we pull together information and tools that might help practitioners in the midst of their teaching actually find their way forward? And so we started co-authoring um, a, a set of tools that are in this practice brief genre. Um, we have published 91 of them, uh, and we have a bunch of other resources that are part of the, the effort as well. And so, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, a thumbnail sketch view of, of the range of things that we have. But all of, all of these resources are responding to either problems of practice that come up or opportunities of practice that are in the vision. Um, and researchers and practitioners come together and pull together kind of our most powerful ideas and resources to help people take up those lines of work. These are all funded through the National Science Foundation projects. And so, you know, at some level, these are your taxpayer dollars hard at work, 
Um, and so like, feel free to use them as you would. Um, they are meant to be adapted and just broadly shared. And so part of the strategy is to really have kind of a, a wildly open sharing practice around the things that we build. If you might be interested in the research uh, strategies that are underneath this work, there's a kind of a design implementation mode of work underneath what we're, we're doing through the collection that has to do with infrastructure and teacher learning about equitable science instruction. So um, this article, um, which you can pull up as a, as a you know, a, an open publication, uh, goes into more depth about just like the, the research behind the work. So if that's of interest, I just um, wanted to kind of share that, that deeper dive piece. So as I mentioned at the top, we've been working with um, the Council of State Science Supervisors across the country for about nine years, actually. So before we even started building tools together. And uh, we these are the folks at the state level agencies or territory level agent, education agencies in the country, uh, kind of responsible for implementing science education across systems of, you know, within their states or territories. So we've been, um, promoting coherence and equity in those efforts by building shared capacity and uh, sensing what's going on out in the field and building resources. So today I'm gonna to be talking about the resource development piece of this collaboration with CSQ. We, over the, the course of the eight years have had different ways of trying to understand um, where to be resourcing people. Um, this particular flower diagram, we call it, is our equity project um, kind of representation. So, a lot, so if the central goal is equitable science and engineering learning that uh, counteracts anti-Blackness and promotes Indigenous sovereignty and promotes equitable uh, learning opportunities for each student, the equity projects around the perimeter are the seven areas where the science ed field has done some work already and there's a lot of forward leaning potential to bring that work throughout networks of science educators so those seven projects um, at some level give different entry points into the work but at the same time um, each each one overlaps with the others so you may you know go into a space to center racial equity in a particular way and find yourself supporting diverse sense making in very kind of specific ways or um going in to kind of disrupt ableism for students receiving special ed services and then figure out that there are ways of framing you know meaningful phenomena that like all students can engage in so these projects do intersect uh, but each one is kind of its own um, strategy for moving towards equitable instruction so these practice briefs I mentioned, um, each, you know, most of the pieces, but not all, are these deceptively simple one pagers that have a front and back side to them. Um, that said, we do have some that are, uh, you know, much longer, but um, we're going to just kind of focus on at least the, the one pagers for a bit. Uh, each one is meant, you know, I think about each one as kind of an idea and resource funnel around problems and opportunities of practice. So how do we pull stuff together? So um, somebody has, you know, a, a go to resource that might be something that they can turn to when an issue comes up in the classroom or if there's an opportunity to move in a certain direction with instruction. Uh, and so within each brief, there's the title and then there's a, a, a concise statement of what is the issue. And then for different stakeholders who are involved with that particular um, topic, uh, there's a little bit of a rationale for like, why does it matter to each of you in, you know, in the system with uh, kind of different roles to play? On the back then is a set of categories, things to consider or the kind of key ideas that relate to that topic that kind of give people traction on how to think about it. There is um, specific guidance under recommended actions you can take where we kind of point out tools and strategies that are very directly responsive and actionable. Uh, each um, brief has attention to equity justice dimensions in integrated into the brief. Some of the briefs are specifically about equity and justice, others uh, embed it in, in this way. And then we have reflection questions for personal and group sense making of the topics and we link off to other resources so that's that's basically what one looks like and now i'm going to kind of fly across a handful of examples just to give you a taste of what kinds of topics are in the collection oh you're seeing my presenter view how exciting what sorry i just saw that 
Let's try that. That should be better for you. <laughs> oh boy. Um, you know, you would think three years in, I would know to check. Okay, so uh, so here we are. Uh, building on actually Dan Meyer's point this morning around math instruction and trying to have a generous interpretation for kids' initial ideas or kind of the ideas that they're refining over time. This particular brief, uh, number 37, is about moving beyond a, a simple right, wrong answer kind of framework around kids' explanations. And like, you know, you're talking about like squeezing the juice out of their initial responses, I think was the metaphor. Uh, here, we talk about facets of kids' thinking that are either more productive or less productive. And so this, this view is a really productive um, way to do that kind of knowledge construction refinement approach um, that was also in the keynote today. Uh, there's been a growing focus within uh, NGSS uh, framework implementation around anchoring phenomena becoming the focus of instructional units of different lengths. And so we were um, bringing our equity stance uh, to that opening up uh, effort within the field to talk about justice-centered phenomena specifically. So uh, matters of local um, consequence or matters that are tied to larger you know, justice movements like environmental racism responses, that kind of thing. And so we have a resource that tries to uh, give guidance around how to kind of hold a, a social justice um, focus within um, uh, the work that uh, kids sink into in units. If you're uh, able to join after the lunch break today, I'll sink into the, uh, I, we have, I don't know, four dozen climate change education resources to share. And so that follow on session goes deeply into the full collection. Um, this resource was our, our first um, climate change, climate science ed resource to really just do that mapping between scientific literacy and how it connects to global climate change. And from a point of view of engaging, um, uh, learners in action. And so um, we, this has really opened up since 2016 within the collection, but this is an initial piece that we wrote um, pretty early on. We have a growing set of uh, projects around disrupting ableism. Uh, so we have two deep resources um, that go in that direction right now. This one is around students are receiving special ed services in particular, and what do we know about creating kind of more equitable science learning opportunities for them. Um, this one pager is then very well paired with an hour long webinar that opens up all sorts of resources underneath um, that work. And so um, I'd encourage you to kind of um, follow up with the brief and then sink into the, the linked um, video recording of the PD module. We also know that not everyone implementing next generation science standards is a frontline educator, either in informal environments or classrooms. And so there are some folks in leadership roles implementing projects, sometimes, sometimes teacher leaders reading, you know, leading projects at building or district levels. So we build resources for folks implementing those leadership projects, um, implementation projects to actually give them the best tools and ideas about like, well, how do I actually shift classroom, you know, not classroom, how do I shift teacher discussion about science implementation across a school building so that it's more constructive and, um, uh, leads to change and there's you know research on that and we try to bring that together in these practice briefs to kind of make it actionable um, for folks leading projects so as we've kind of found our way in um there are uh kind of topical clusters that have started to come together so, and they're pretty easily searched out on the website so you can kind of go to the tools tab of, of stemteachingtools.org and pull up these different topics we have a growing uh, batch around the inclusion of engineering in the science ed framework vision and how do you help youth kind of find their way into design practices in relation to science learning we have uh kind of a, a of quite deep collection around learner-centered talk and tools that can support AL. Open up a couple of these a little bit more depth, but we know that you know the person doing the talking is the person doing the learning. And so, like, how do we get kids to be talking about their ideas and refining them with each other and with uh, teachers? In that space, we have a, a growing community across the US that is multilingual. And so how do we create kind of fair and um, equitable learning experiences for multilingual learners specifically. And 
we've been developing some resources in that direction and we have kind of more in development and there's other great groups like WIDA has been doing really great work in this space if you're familiar with the WIDA organization. And uh, connected to the, um, the work around climate, we also do a lot of work around place-based science education. So uh, here's a, a quick gather of the resources that relate to place-based science ed. So getting kids out into places in community, into natural context to do science um, and to make sense of the world around them. So uh, another deep dive uh, direction that you can go into. I would say um, that our work with the state science supervisors uh, really focused primarily around formative assessment as a lever of, of transformation. And so uh, we have uh, you know, a couple dozen, probably three dozen different resources around formative assessment specifically. And I'll like talk about them at different points as I kind of share some of the, the PD modules of specifically in just a minute. Um, but we have um, formative assessment tools um, that you can use to um, support 3D learning. Here you see kind of the range of other topics that are in the broader collection. And I think I've touched on most of them um, already, just as I kind of get some examples on the table. Uh, about two dozen of the resources are translated into Spanish, if that actually works um, better within your community. And we have another 20 that are drafted that are making their way into the collection. So stay tuned um, for more resources um, in Spanish. And with that, I am going to um, pause for a second. I need to reach for, I guess I have to pop out one second. I'm going to stop sharing. And I thought we'd stop and do a little bit of a dive into one resource so we can kind of see what one looks like firsthand as a group. So if you are in a place on your machine where you can pull up that particular link, this um, it is uh, Native American Heritage Month uh, this month. It should be uh, Heritage Month for Native Americans every month. Um, in that way, uh, we have, um, I think, 37 different resources and then uh, a set of others that um, center Indigenous equity and approaches uh, within the collection. So we're going to just stop for a few minutes and kind of let you uh, get a sense of this particular um, practice brief that kind of goes into that direction of supporting students that come in culturally grounded in uh, ways of making sense of the natural world that are rooted in indigenous perspectives. So let's uh, stop and pause and we'll come back together and just work um, for a long time. And uh, one reminder that she gives to rooms of educators who may not think they serve indigenous youth is that 80% of Indigenous youth live in urban centers. And so if you if you um, teach in a city, you likely serve Indigenous youth. And so um, trying to like understand those local particulars are really helpful. And so if you um, want to, you know, I'll, I'll drop a resource uh, that can help you do that in just a second. Um, but um, let's pick up the threads here. Um, there's a, um, a survey of, uh, cross-section of the country that basically points out a big structural problem around Indigenous history and education. So 87% of state-level history standards actually fail to cover Native people's history. And in, in science education, has a role to talk about Indigenous science history um, as well. Um, and yet 72% of Americans really would rather have an accurate representation of Native history in the curricular experience. So if those numbers are useful to you to kind of lobby for that work in your space, I kind of wanted to, if you follow the link that's in this uh, slide, you can kind of get to the broader uh, research base underneath this. We've also been curating a set of examples and uh, stories and articles and background pieces uh, about how indigenous ways of knowing relate to science and STEM and teaching um, STEM education. And so if uh, those 140 examples are useful, they're kind of all gathered in a Pinterest collection that's kind of linked off the side. So I'll kind of give you a, a pointer there um, to sink into some uh, particular work examples. So we have lots of resources. And so then trying to figure out uh, how to best navigate them becomes kind of the next uh, question. Um, and so um, one strategy we came up with pretty early is to come up with a playlist of resources that go in a particular direction for a particular purpose. And so if you're doing you know, an NGSS framework overview to teachers or working with school principals and you have a half hour, 
you know, what might you do um, with those particular contexts. And so each playlist gives a little mini lesson plan for how to kind of open up a set of resources to kind of serve a purpose. So those are on the PD tab of the website as well. So those are um, useful and we have a few others that we'll be posting in the near future. And now uh, for something completely different, uh, we, have, uh, we have the one pagers and those are really powerful because they kind of fit moments of practice and, uh, and response. Um, but we also have open education PD modules. So um, we've been publishing um, these experiences across a set of topics here. You'll see these are almost all about formative assessment, talking about that strategy I was talking about earlier. Um, the last one's about phenomena-based instruction, so, but the others are all you know, assessment related. And we're just trying to like give people great starting resources for um, professional learning experiences that they may either be running themselves or wanting to um, use themselves. And so uh, each collection or each PD resource comes with the slides and the facilitator notes and the embedded resources and um, and student work often uh, just to kind of be uh, an active space where you can make sense of things. Going back to the facets of kids thinking resource um, that I pointed to earlier, we actually have a, a PD module that, that runs uh, easily within like a two thirds of a day kind of professional learning um, uh, time format to like open up that around a, that particular practice of facets of kids thinking and responding to their facets through a batch of student work that's embedded in the resource. So small groups of teachers come together and make sense of the diversity of kids thinking and then think about instructional responses uh, in relation to them. So each of the PD modules has that kind of set of uh, embedded resources. And these have been quite popular as, you know, PLCs or different teacher groups um, are trying to, you know, open up PD um, for uh, science ed. So uh, just to kind of pop up a level um, around different uses of the collection. So in those PD events, uh, there's lots of different things you can do there. I think we have a really strong individual user base. And so um, people uh, will talk about how they love seeing new ones come out and uh, you know, something that they always seek out and have in their, in their to read pile. Um, we have numbers of groups either in person around PLCs or online around professional learning networks using the resources. Uh, there's, I think, one online network um, set, set of events, like a book club kind of format just wrapped up this week. And we have others kind of lining up in that way. So uh, there's kind of ways to use them in that approach. People use them with uh, principals or state STEM groups or assessment design teams or informal science organizations to try to help them understand uh, the 3D vision that's in the framework. Um, so those uses can be useful. We have a lot of colleagues teaching in teacher ed who make use of them in their science methods courses or graduate seminars. And then um, we have folks who use them just around messaging. So we'll, we have language in the, in the website under uh, the news uh, column where you can just pluck text and fold it into your newsletter that goes out to your science ed uh, network. So we have a lot of folks that kind of repurpose the tools and flow them out through um, communication channels that are already in play. And then a few teachers have told us they actually use them with parents to talk about what's going on in the classroom. So there's a subset of them that are um, helpful for like, or like what does the modeling look like in the classroom, that kind of thing. So I'm gonna pause. I've been talking a fair amount and we have 15 more minutes to spend together. Uh, and so the prompt for the chat um, is, you know, do you have any questions about the resource collection as I've described it? And if so, you can kind of just write question colon, whatever your question is. Or if you have a topic of interest to you related to equitable STEM ed, um, uh, you can just name that topic, so topic colon, and I'll I'll try to do a quick on the fly memory uh, thing to see if uh, there's something that jumps out as a possible resource um, for you uh, in the collection. So we'll stop and just let this run for a few minutes, and I'll um, I'll see what comes up in the chat. Doctor Bell, can I talk? Uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah, please. Hi. Okay, uh, Dr. Bell, I'm Dr. Lin, and I'm yeah. a medical doctor. Yeah. I'm currently uh, teaching a uh, teaching one the magazine school uh, at the uh, at the Las Vegas. Uh, 
Uh, it's a magnet school, one of the best. Okay. But uh, uh, as you know, all, all public school or even the magnet school, we use uh, random uh, random selection for the student. So um, what I see for my class, one third is really good, one third is in the middle, and one third they should not be in that school. Uh, uh, for uh, for ad academic perspective, they're extremely low, and also from motivation standpoint, yeah. they're also very low. Why, uh, why the public education magnet school use that kind of policy instead? Yeah, you're... Uh, we, uh, we are not like the college uh, select the best we can, because yeah. when, uh, we are uh, actually all the best, uh, some of the best students are not going to be able to get into those magnet school. And uh, they have to go into the zoning school. Instead, yeah. gave some people that uh, they not should be not that, not should be there. Well, um, let me say so you're pulling us into a very deep conversation about like the purposes of education and how we actually organize for equity and pathways of uh, different purposes within the system. I, I guess I, you know, um, I would say related to the NRC framework and, and standards that are um, kind of centered in our collection and in the, all the work around implementing educational standards, that is really like the that's an image of scientific literacy that each student should have a right to understand. So like there is a little bit of like that is what through that consensus process we came up as what the the shared image of of uh, understandings and practices would be for for each and every student. I think um, what I hear you describing uh, sometimes gets. Uh, framed as kind of a talent search purpose to science education or STEM education? How do you find talent for particular kinds of uh, workforce um, uses perhaps or you know, activities? I, you know, I can certainly understand how to help people find their way towards particular pathways of deeper uh, kind of relevance and expertise. This, uh, there's a lot of models that do that kind of work starting at high school to kind of differentiate different pathways for youth. I, I guess for me, I still, would worry uh, a lot about just the equity issues that are underneath how those pathways get created and like who finds their way in. And I, I, in one research literature that I think is underneath your description of the student population is around uh, kind of learner identity related to science or STEM, like who is identified with the endeavor. And there have not been equal opportunities for students to become identified with science. And if you connect that to the long-term de developmental pathway to become a scientist or an engineer, or to have literacy in those in those ways, then you're talking about um, how do we rebuild those relationships? In the keynote that launched today, a lot of what um, Dan Meyer was describing, I saw as identity-related issues connected to math, and there are parallel issues around science. And so do, see, do, do all you know, elementary school kids see that connection to science and are, are they brought through a pathway where they kind of hold onto it? And often when, they, when that is not possible, then you get kind of different uh, connections to the endeavor and different motivations that show up in classroom life like you're describing. I don't think there's an easy answer beyond that, um, but I will say that um, you know, I, I appreciate people sinking in and trying to figure out like how do we create more equitable spaces um, and to try to do that work to help people find their way along into things that are meaningful. So I guess I'll I'll probably leave it there. Yeah, I think that what you talk about is uh, trying to point a way for the people who are not as fortunate as the other people. But when you point a way for those things, they're not taking it. Now, yeah, what well, do yeah, I from think that point. There is actually, there's quite a bit of research showing that when students are brought into spaces of meaningful engagement around even compl complicated topics that they may not be, you know, used to engaging with, uh, a number of them do actually start to become interested in it. So, um, and to find their way along. That's That said, like if you're in high school, but like you've kind of not been brought into deeper science understanding in the previous 10 years, you're going to be in a different place than if you were on a pathway that was 
more lined up with a deepening of understanding and identity. Um, so those longer term developmental things are certainly in play. So but I appreciate the question. I'm staring at the clock and I want to do a little bit of wrap up here, but um, but thanks for, for opening up um, that, that conversation. So I wanted to um, point to some of the particular resources and just open them up a little bit. Um, so if you think about learner-centered um, approaches to making sense of phenomena through talk and action, uh, just to kind of point to some particular ones that I think people have really, uh, educators have really loved. Uh, STEM Teaching Tool 35 was uh, Dr. Kerry Winger pulled this particular one together. It basically supports educators in thinking about like, what is the purpose of the talk that I want kids to engage in? And so across those four different um, instructional purposes, Kerry then connected that to different um, ways, different kind of um, activity approaches to engage them in that in that talk and interaction. So you can kind of see a, kind of a, a playlist of sort of sorts here saying if you're you know trying to get students to explain their thinking and you're at the beginning of a unit, then a share trade activity you know is a really great approach. Um, so it's kind of like a very actionable resource. And this particular one has teacher facing and student facing um, materials embedded in it. So you can kind of plug and play if you use slides in your in your classroom context. The other one I would lift, lift up is STEM teaching tool number 48, which has a couple of dozen embedded um, uh, scaffolds for talk for different kinds of talk at different phases of uh, science investigation. So kind of similar to what Carrie was doing in the last resource, this one like takes it one more step in, in depth um, to actually have these kind of table tent cards and other ways, other, other kinds of resources to give guidance to students about what the kind of conversation that you're hoping to have at a particular phase of an investigation. So if you're trying to pull together different ideas across research groups that have been pursuing the same thing, like how do they make sense of those different um, explanations they're coming up with and do that in a way that's equitable and fair. Um, so these uh, table tents and the other related resources for teachers in this resource have also been really popular among um, folks in the, in the community. And so I'm going to go to do some wrapping up pieces here. Um, you know, the we are throughout the work, we hold an equity and justice focus to what we do that kind of has short term and long term uh, agendas that we work on. I think um, as we think about that work in our in our networks, um, this guiding uh, comment from a, a close faculty colleague of mine, Ken Sarotnik, um, is often a prompt that comes to mind. So whose interests are being served um, by that resource allocation, by that instructional decision to go in that direction, by um, that particular uh, approach to engaging students in understanding a, a phenomena. So whose interests are foregrounded and whose are backgrounded and can we do work to kind of create more equitable opportunities for students? Um, colleagues who uh, wrote a really fabulous equity chapter uh, that shows up in the NSTA book that's in the bottom right. They summarize it this way that, you know, the bottom line is the more you show genuine intellectual and scientific interest in your student sense making of phenomena, the more you expand the space of possible relations among you, your students and science. So going back a bit to kind of our, our interaction a few minutes ago. You know, a lot of students haven't had opportunities to really expand possible connections between themselves and science and how it relates to their community and other purposes in society. So how do we actually do that work to kind of um, create those uh, spaces of exploration? And I would say underneath this is the idea that, you know, engaging in intellectual relationships with each of your students is a vital um, strategy for opening up those meaningful connections and uh, helping students see themselves, you know, as part of the endeavor um, in ways that uh, carry them forward into new new spaces. So uh, if you're looking for a, a deep dive um, to get oriented to a bunch of the, the equity work all at once, it's, it is a, a very uh, fire hose approach, but STEM Teaching Tool 71 is a two pager that puts all seven projects on the table. And so um, I would encourage people that really kind of want to do a deep dive to kind of explore that particular resource. 
we are always uh, looking to uh, collaborate with other teams and, and groups who um, have found their way into an approach that they wanna share with others. So if there's something missing um, from our resource collection, uh, feel free to kind of reach out to us and I'll give you some points of contact in a minute. Uh, so if you're bumping into particular problems or you've kind of uh, had a breakthrough around particular things, um, please let us know. We, we are, the collection uh, right now is very self-generating at some level. We have about 20 new briefs that are in production and so expect more to be coming in and we're, we're always kind of looking to keep expanding um, new resources. So um, if you go to this particular link, uh, you'll find in just a little bit, uh, it's not there at the moment because I was trying to upload it, uh, you'll find a, a zip file that includes all of the resources um, bound up in one, um, one file that you can grab. Otherwise, you can kind of go through the stemteachingtools.org website and explore particular ones. Uh, for as long as Twitter is still active, um, we are on Twitter and we share things daily and have conversations there. Jeannie Norris is our practitioner uh, partnership person in residence who uh, engages uh, with the, the Twitter community the most, um, but like feel free to reach us you know, on Twitter at STEM Teach Tools. And if you want a kind of a low, uh, uh, low impact kind of way just to keep track of what we're up to. We do have a newsletter that goes out every two to three months that just lifts up the new stuff. Um, so if we don't use emails for anything else, so it's a, uh, you won't get a bunch of junk mail after you sign up. It really is just for us to kind of get things out to people who care about the work. So um, easy sign up. And, uh, you know, hold on to the Native uh, uh, American Heritage Month uh, focus as best you are able, and uh, let us know if there are other things that uh, might find their way into this particular collection as well. And so um, with that, I'm going to just go to the very last slide, which points to um, a bunch of places I've already mentioned. And uh, thank you all for coming today. Really appreciate um, the work that you're doing. It is a complicated moment and continues to be so. And I hope you are are well and uh, are able to take a little bit of a breather uh, next week and through winter break and get um, a little bit of uh, regeneration going. So thanks everyone. <laughs>